and uh, all of Small Business Administration in Washington, D.C. Uh, welcome to the webinar. We're glad you're able to join us. Want to uh, thank you all as IEEE USA members for uh, joining the webinar. To let you know that the uh, U.S. Small Business Administration and IEEE USA have struck a strategic alliance this current year to help share information between our two organizations uh, and the members of IEEE USA. Um, to that end, we've initiated a series of webinars, and this is the second in a series of what will probably be five or six webinars. The initial webinar that we held was more of an introduction uh, to the SBA and what we call our resource partner network, which include a distinguished uh, group of organizations and business counselors that offer entrepreneurial training to the, uh, the nation, whether it's face-to-face -face counseling, workshops, um, online training, uh, publications or other tools that folks can avail themselves of. Uh, for the current webinar, we wanted to focus a little bit more uh, deeply into the world of entrepreneurship and especially tech startups. So we invited uh, one of our resource partners from Missouri, the Small Business Development Center Network there, to have some of their leadership and business counselors uh, featured during this webinar. I'm going to briefly introduce three gentlemen that will be running us through the webinar, and as Helen mentioned, um, you'll have an opportunity to either uh, type questions into the chat feature, and at the end of the webinar, we'll definitely leave time so you can ask the gentlemen any questions um, uh, that they can respond to. But really quickly, first I'm going to mention that we have uh, Jim Gann, who is the Director of uh, Tech Business Development uh, in Missouri. Uh, Jim's got an excellent entrepreneurial background. He's nationally certified as an economic development finance professional and as a tech business counselor. Uh, along with Jim, we'll have Max Summers. Max happens to be our state director for the Missouri Small Business Development Centers, uh, which includes uh, a very rich network in and of itself of 10 full-service centers, six satellite centers, seven special service centers, and 15 university extension business development specialists. So Missouri's got a great network out there. Uh, they're reflective of many of the small business development center networks throughout the country, which are coordinated at a state basis. Um, Mac, Max also has the distinction of having previously led the National Association of Small Business Development Centers, having served as its president in 95 and 96. Uh, last but not least, we'll also feature uh, Francis, who is, uh, serves as the Director of External Operations for the MoFast team of technology business development specialists. Uh, that team helps emerging technology firms uh, especially with a focus on government research and development grants. Um, he also serves as a mentor to the Information Technology Entrepreneurial Network in St. Louis. So as you can tell, each of these uh, gentlemen have a great background, are very active from a number of different angles supporting uh, tech startups in their particular area, and again, quite often they're, they're uh, leading from a national perspective within their network. Um, I'm going to um, jump off real quick and hand it over to Jim. Again, he's the Director of Technology Business Development, and he's going to uh, get into the, uh, the reason we're here to teach you all a little bit more about issues surrounding tech startups. Jim? Thank you, Jack. Um, first of all, uh, we want to say thank you very much for the opportunity to, to present to uh, such an honorable group as the IEEE and the SBA today. And uh, what we'd like to do, first of all, is uh, in our slide deck, is to give you a little overview of our system and how our system works. And as Jack mentioned, uh, regardless of where you are in the country, uh, very likely you'll be able to find some of the very same resources uh, available to you more locally. Um, so uh, again, I want to stress that those resources are available in almost all the states, but you may just have to search for them a little bit. Uh, but I wanted to give you a, not only an overview of our system, uh, but then an overview of the process that we use to uh, nurture technology-based companies. And then, as has been mentioned at the end, we'd like to leave plenty of time for questions um, so, and, and be responsive to, the, to what you're interested in. So we will... Uh, we will move forward here.
Ellen, I seem to have a poll question in the middle of my slide deck that I can't move. And hey, Jim, this is Jack. Um, I, I, I did neglect to mention, I think we we're going to just pose a couple quick poll questions to the members, um, just to get their quick feedback that you guys could sort of uh, respond to later in your presentation or get a feel for the, the members. Oh, OK. Um, Helen, if you do want to pop that back up again, there's a couple quick questions for those that are dialed in. If you'll just take a quick second, choose the uh, option that most reflects uh, your current situation. The question up there right now, what sources are you considering for uh, finance, uh, which um, Jim, Max, and, and Francis will remind us all that finance is critical and, and folks use different means to get their firm started up. So if you can take just a few seconds to click a couple of those options, uh, Helen's team will compute the results on the other end. Okay. Um, and I saw uh, one of the highest highest things there on the poll was uh, federal financing, and, and uh, we're going to touch on that just a little bit. So uh, to begin, we're going to talk a little bit about how our system is organized. So some of this may be a little bit repetitive from your last webinar, but, but um, our program, which is the Missouri Small Business and Technology Development Center Network, that program is actually uh, a partnership between uh, three spheres of organizations that provide us funding year to year. Uh, primarily, uh, that is the Small Business Administration, uh, but those federal dollars are matched, uh, matched by dollars that are local dollars and state dollars. Um, so we are also in partnership uh, with the Missouri Department of Economic Development, which um, it, it has its subunit, the Missouri Technology Corporation, and then the University of Missouri Extension, which provides the local dollars. So we, we are a three-way uh, partnership uh, to deploy services. Our, our purpose uh, is, as you can read there, is to bring research-based education uh, to, the, to the folks in the state uh, and what we're really focused on is improving the lives of Missourians and assisting with the competitiveness of Missouri businesses. So uh, that's what we wake up every morning to do, and, and that's what all of us enjoy doing every day when we come to work, is, is to get our, uh, get our hands dirty, uh, helping Missouri's entrepreneurs to be better at, at what they do. Um, how those services actually uh, deployed, how they're actually deployed is... Uh, um, listed here in that the, the primary thing that we do is we offer confidential business management consulting. Um, oftentimes when I first engage a client, what I tell them is I'm really a management consultant that some of their tax dollars have already paid for. And, and because of that, I'm able to bring services to them uh, basically for free. Uh, and again, the outcomes that we're looking for are economic development outcomes of more successful businesses. Uh, but we also we also work with we do uh, financial projections, business commercialization plans. We work in the arena of market research. Um, we do teach conventional seminar type classes uh, that you can see listed there. And then of our uh, roughly 40 person staff that uh, engages in doing this day to day, um, there is a subset of about 10 of us that have had additional training and uh, work in the area of technology development. So that's really what we're going to talk about primarily here today. Um, as was already mentioned, we do have a network, um, and these are how our resources are deployed around the state. Um, our, the blue dots represent business development folks that uh, we would consider to be general business development. Um, and, and we try to, as I said, deploy them around the state to make uh, the access work uh, no matter where you are. Um, we have a sister program that is called Procurement Technical Assistance Program, and uh, those folks are deployed where the red dots indicate. And then uh, our subset of SBTDC counselors that work in technology commercialization are represented by the green dots. And the strategic decision about where they are placed is that <clears throat> uh, the three dots in the center of the state uh, represent uh, the state's um, well, the state-supported universities where the intellectual property is primarily created. Um, and you'll see green dots in Kansas City, St. Louis, and Springfield, 
And those are our uh, metropolitan centers or where our uh, commerce and industry centers are in the state. And so they've been deployed in this manner to make, uh, to make these uh, connections between the intellectual property that's created by the state universities and the industrial centers. So uh, we're very uh, specific about how those resources were deployed. Um, how the, how the uh, system works, um, and I've already alluded to this a little bit, and th these are the numbers from 2006 through 2008, but we had in, uh, investment on the federal, state, and local levels uh, that goes into our network. And our network isn't just the University of Missouri, although it is the primary grantee. Um, we have sub-grantees that constitute all of the other state-supported universities in the state. So we have an incredibly complex, uh, but yet uh, all-encompassing network of business development folks. And with that input of money, we're able to produce economic outcomes, and those economic outcomes you can see are listed on, on the right-hand side of the slide. So in a nutshell, um, as a program, that's what we do every day. Um, I'll let Francis um, go next for a little bit about uh, how, how this now um, comes to terms with uh, technology-based companies. Thank you, Jim. Uh, as Jim eloquently articulated, this can be a, a complex network uh, to produce some of those uh, impact results that we do uh, on the job creation and economic development front. And uh, it can be even confusing internally as well. Um, but our goal and our future success, our present and future success is really tied to uh, continuing to see our work from, from the entrepreneur's perspective. And uh, that's why I wanted to focus on for the next couple of slides. It's just um, we really feel that our network, uh, all the behind-the-scenes efforts that we do, partnerships and stakeholder relations that we have, um, can serve as sort of an integrated network uh, that will hopefully align the research and development capabilities and capacities within the state universities uh, with the entrepreneurial talent of small businesses. And uh, what that really means is we should be able to do that both in a push and pull manner. Uh, Jim, who's located here in the University of Missouri at Columbia, sees a lot of faculty that may have some entrepreneurial ideas, may have started a company, and are looking to push their technology out into the marketplace. I'm based in the St. Louis region and see a lot of entrepreneurs with some technical know-how and good ideas, but probably need the, the research capacity and, and, and talent that relies within our universities and be able to pull some of that intellectual property out and add it to their business plan in order to make a successful company they can bring to market. We have to keep in mind that the entrepreneur's perspective is oftentimes confusing when it comes to these choices that are out there. In your communities and online, there's probably several entrepreneurial support organizations. And, and our job is to really crystallize that down to uh, form a pathway that the entrepreneur can follow and that we can assist as a facilitator. So how do we do that? Um, our statewide network, while complex, is also a tremendous asset. Uh, we're able to create linkages in each of the regions where we have locations, as you saw on the map previous, to really address those needs that technology commercialization clients have in order to bring their technology to market. And as has been mentioned already and is probably uh, in the poll questions as well, what are they concerned with? Well, primarily they're concerned with how to fund something especially at an early stage where they need seed capital for some R&D uh, funding. Well, we help with that. We help on a state level with what limited funds the state of Missouri has to put into this region. We are in, integrally a, a part of dispersing those, managing those, and being good stewards of those. And as we'll see in a little bit, we also look at federal grant opportunities. Those are probably some of the best and most targeted programs to help small businesses develop their technology to a point where they can attract perhaps uh, an angel or a venture capital investor, or maybe be able to take it to market with another larger corporate partner or, or another player such as that. We also, as I've mentioned, try to foster industry and university collaborations. Uh, we look at the relationship that business might have with our intellectual property that resides at our universities, um, and then we provide the educational and network events that the high-tech entrepreneurs are looking for. Sometimes just putting a group of them in a room to get them to talk about the challenges that they're facing 
can be very enlightening as people are on different pathways and different levels of progress in developing their particular business. And then we work primarily by embedding ourselves within many of the state and regional stakeholders in tech commercialization. And some of these are probably familiar to you in your communities as well. Uh, they include high-tech incubators. Uh, we work very closely with the Missouri Department of Economic Development. Uh, we try to formulate great relationships with angel investor networks and econo regional economic councils. Uh, I, for instance, am located in office within an incubator on the campus of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. So some of my clients are down the hall. Uh, and we're actually seen as advancing the mission and the purpose of that incubator in addition to the work that we do because we provide entrepreneurs with this kind of pathway. Those are sort of the ways that we do in each of our individual regions to bring individual strengths collectively into the statewide network. So MoFast uh, was a program of the Missouri Small Business and Technology Development Center is, is this subset of uh, specialties that works on technology-based company, companies. Um, in 2009, it was funded at $500,000 from the state of Missouri. Um, and just as a little bit of background, the MOFAS program was <clears throat> originally a program started by the Small Business Administration. Um, and we'll show you kind of a history of that towards the end of the presentation. But uh, in Missouri, we lag um, our per capita share of gaining small business innovation and research small business technology transfer grants, which are called SBIR, STTR awards. Those are federal dollars that are granted to small businesses, not universities, but small businesses uh, for technology development. In Missouri, we were woefully lagging um, our per capita share of those. And uh, that money, now state money, but previously SBA money, was used uh, to bring those uh, bring us up to level and surpass where we should be. And we have results from that uh, that we'll share with you towards the end of the, uh, end of the presentation. But the MOFAST program, again, is just a subset of technology counselors that are involved with the Small Business and Technology Development Center. So each these SBIRS TTR awards that I spoke about, um, each year the federal government makes about $2.5 billion available to small businesses. Um, in most cases, the definition of small business is less than 500 employees, so you can be a rather large small business. And, and what, these, what these awards are focused on is the commercialization of technologies. Um, so um, it's not necessarily a research grant in the way that you would, an academic would think of a research grant. What it is really, although it can be used some for research, but really what it's all about is, is that pull through of <coughs> making intellectual property in, into something that can make your life and my life better. So you heard Francis refer to a commercialization pathway. And in Missouri, this is, uh, this is kind of how we visualize that pathway. Uh, on the left-hand side of the slide, to the left of the red dotted line, are all the resources that we have available within the state um, that can be used to develop uh, basically an idea and do the preliminary work to seek more funding. So the boxes that are in red are funds that are available from state coffers to assist in this process. The uh, boxes that are in blue there are the resources that have to come together to make these things, excuse me, make these things happen which is university research and expertise, and of course business and industry have to come together. And also in Missouri, we're very fortunate enough to have, uh, to have yet another pool of funds, and uh, that is a U.S. Army program called the Leonard Wood Institute, which is associated with the United States Army uh, post uh, called Fort Leonard Wood. So those funds can all be used to help formalize an idea, <clears throat> formulate an idea, I'm sorry, and make an application for a phase one SBIR. Um, so as we transition across that red dotted line and we enter into the pathway of funding that involves the small business innovation and research grants, um, the, the common or the average deliverable or the average amount of award, I'm sorry, for a phase one is $75,000 roughly. 
And the deliverable at the end of that for a small business would be a, uh, a concept being developed. Um, there is a gap between phase one and phase two, and uh, there are some state dollars that can assist with that gap process there that is the red block that you see that says commercialization assistance plan. Uh, but if you're successful, um, statistically across the nation, um, uh, Fifteen percent of the applicants of a phase one um, are accepted into the phase one program. Statistically, if you're in phase one, you have a 50-50 chance of winning a phase two, which is more serious dollars and more, um, um, more work can be done. Just to give you an idea of the time frames, the typical time frame for a phase one is six months. The typical time frame for a phase two is about two years worth of development. But the typical deliverable at the end of a phase two is the development of a prototype. And from there you go into phase three. So if, if you're the small company, if you're the small business, and you reach phase three, you will have, if, assuming that you've been successful in winning all of the enhancements along the way, you will have uh, over a million dollars invested in your idea, which is going to make it very, very attractive to seek funding at some point um, when you've reached that level of development. Also very likely, depending on who gave you those grant dollars, and what I'm thinking of in particular is the Department of Defense, if they've invested, uh, if they've invested a significant amount of money by then, almost a million dollars in your idea, very likely they're going to be the very first customers um, that you'll have. So this isn't necessarily a, sim a webinar on SBIR, STTR, but I wanted to give you an idea of of kind of how we use those programs in a day-to-day -day basis. So when I first encounter a technology-based company, which uh, this is Jim, and I'm located on the campus of the University of Missouri in Columbia, which is our largest public generator of intellectual property in the state, um, very often my clients that come in are university researchers who are very esteemed in whatever their fields are. Um, and they'll tell me that they've created a new technology. In fact, they've already thought about how it would be deployed. And after it's in the field, they've done the test. They've determined the mean time to failure. And they've thought about replacement costs in the field and all those kinds of things that very technically minded people do. Um, and usually at that point, I get to ask a series of questions. And one question is, well, so what? What's that do for me? Uh, because sometimes the researchers are advancing science, and that's fine. We need them to do that. But it doesn't mean they have a commercial product. Other times, other times they'll say that they've thought about how it can be replaced in the field. And I'll say, great, you're a third of the way there. And uh, that usually gets me uh, some, uh, some bad looks. Uh, but what we try to do is use this that you see in front of you, the Goldsmith Technology Commercialization Model. We use that as a framework to help them understand um, the cycles that their business will have to go through. The uh, kind of magenta color there, if, if you want to think of this uh, moving left to right as, as three vectors that the business must mature on, uh, the technology itself has to mature, and it has to go from investigation through maturity. And our researchers here are very adept at, at, at all that, as I just described. But what they're less adept is, is understanding if there's a need for it in the market are less adept at under, and less adept at understanding of even if there's a need in the market, is there a business model that will support it? So these three vectors uh, have to have to develop um, uh, in concert with each other, so that you are developing a technology that not only do people want, uh, but that will be have a business model built around it that will support its further development. So. Um, we use this model a good bit, and it's, it's very handy when we lay it out for someone as to, uh, as to the, three, uh, the three vectors that, that the company needs to develop on. So we've given you a little background about our program and given you a little background about our methodology. And, and what we thought we'd share with you uh, for the next few minutes is, so, so how does this really work? Um, so uh, I'll lead it off with a, uh, a case study of a company called TechGuard. Uh, TechGuard is a business based in St. Louis, Missouri. 
Uh, they are a developer of uh, firewalls and sensors, uh, although they've, they've been very successful in the firewall world and have become very, very successful government contractors. Um, I don't know what their um, employee count is currently, but it's in 50. Oh, it's, it's 50 currently, and they have two locations, one in St. Louis and one in Washington, D.C., but they have become a, a quite a well-respected uh, defense contractor in the world of cybersecurity. Uh, we like to tell this story because it really goes full circle. The, the founder of the company started in her basement with little more than an idea and engaged our program probably 10 or 12 years ago uh, to really uh, get her company started. So she received help from our program. Uh, GRU has become successful, a multi-million dollar company, well, what's interesting about coming full circle now is that now she is in a position um, to, take it, uh, to take it to the next level. She is now sponsoring research within the College of Engineering here on the campus of the University of Missouri. Um, she is sponsoring research to have the technologist help her take her company to the next level. Um, so that, that's a great story for us to tell, that it's full circle. Started in her basement uh, with really little more than an idea. Assistance from the university uh, got her up and going through her own tenacity, became very successful, um, and has now come around to the place where she is now re-engaging the university to go to the next level. So we, we love to tell that story. Um, another case study, which this is one of my clients here on the college uh, in the University of Missouri in the College of Engineering, uh, Shubra and Kishab Gangapadier um, are... Um, electrical engineers, and they have started, uh, they work in the arena of, of nanotechnology. Um, they, uh, they, are a, they are faculty members. They have a faculty spin-out company. Um, they are electrical engineers. On the academic side of the realm, they are very, very well funded um, in a number of the initiatives that they've undertaken as researchers. Um, they've also been funded fairly well as SBIR, STTR winners um, to commercialize some of those things that they've discovered in the lab. And their little company, which I believe has uh, no more than five employees at the moment, is, is in the midst of making collaborations with uh, Boeing and a number of other Fortune 50 companies to bring, to bring their nanotechnology to the world. So um, it won't be too far into the future where you can see the technology that was on their bench top, uh, you know, making, making each of our lives better. Um, another case study, so we, we've shown you a little company in St. Louis that started with nothing, and that was um, uh, TechGuard. Uh, we talked about a faculty spin-out. Uh, another company is in the St. Louis region that uh, is kind of a hybrid of both those ideas. Um, these gentlemen uh, were um, in a research, uh, a research organization that was not a university-based research organization, and they decided to go out on their own um, to manufacture sensing systems. So uh, to give you the gist of what they're doing is, is that if you, have a, uh, if you have a giant pool of water, how can you be assured that the water sample you pull from any given place is going to be accurately re reflective of of what that pool of water is actually uh, actually contains. Well, they have a proprietary system where they can assure you, um, uh, either in water or air sampling, that that the uh, sample reflects the uh, the body that's being tested. So they do that through a series of concentration, and, and I won't get into their whole thing. But uh, the interesting case here is that they were they were industry-based researchers that struck out on their own and have a very high-tech company in a very little town uh, outside of Kansas City, Missouri, and, and they're doing some very cutting-edge stuff. And, and with our assistance, they've been able um, to gain some SBIR funding. And uh, as you can see there on the right in the lower right-hand uh, picture, they now have a product that's, that's ready to go to the market. Um, this is something that's been very important for us in Missouri is, is that as we move from an information economy to a tech-based economy, uh, or, or both those together, I guess, is that, is that companies like this can be absolutely anywhere. Uh, information-based companies, 
uh, can be anywhere that there's an internet connection. These technology companies can be uh, in people's garages just about anywhere. I'm going to go ahead and give Jim just a bit of a break here. He's been talking for a little bit and go over a couple more case studies. Um, this company, Titan Nova, is an interesting case study. Uh, this is actually um, a business, a uh, fairly experienced business owner uh, who had run uh, a company before using similar technology. Uh, Titan Nova uses, uh, uh, they do novel material processing solutions using diode lasers. So this was an entrepreneur that was uh, fairly savvy uh, in terms of running a business, was also very, very experienced and more knowledgeable about his technology than we would ever be. Um, so how could we how could we help a client like this? Well, we looked into our network, and uh, one of the things we can do is, is try to find new applications or new markets for the technology that he's using. The SBIR program proved to be a good source. We were able to find uh, applications across different uh, different federal agencies, including the Department of Defense and the Department of Energy. Uh, and then we were also able to look into, uh, as Jim mentioned earlier, we have a relationship with the Leonard Wood Institute, which is in South Central Missouri. Uh, this is a, something that the entrepreneur in St. Louis had not heard about, and, and one of our MOFAS counselors had a good relationship with the Leonard Wood Institute. They have uh, on their uh, facility at Fort Leonard Wood, they, they deal with maneuver and support uh, mechanisms for the Army and uh, for really all branches of the military. So they have a lot of heavy equipment, trucks, tanks, uh, any, any, any kind of ground movement support. Well, some of this gentleman's uh, material processing would work very well for uh, some of the, and, and be applied very well to some solutions at, uh, the, at Fort Leonard Wood. Uh, and we were able to uh, hook him up effectively with, with leadership there, and he was able to win a research grant through the Leonard Wood Institute. Uh, in addition, uh, through our assistance, this client has won about a million dollars in SBIR awards, including a phase two from the Department of Energy. Um, these funds have allowed him to cash flow positively, to grow his staff up to about 10 employees, uh, and continue to work on his business development efforts that he had already started when he, when he bought and, and, and started the company. Another, and our last case study, uh, is an interesting company in the Kansas City area called QM Power. They have some patented technology in the area of uh, electric motor generator and actuator technologies. Uh, and they're a relatively new company, started up in 2006. Um, we have helped them look at multiple opportunities across different federal agencies. They've won over a million in SBIR awards from everybody from the National Science Foundation, the Department of Defense, Department of Energy, uh, as well as uh, NASA uh, has had interest in some of their electric motors. Um, they uh, were also, through our MOFAST relationship and counselor on the ground at the K University of Missouri, Kansas City, um, helped generate an effective company university partnership. Uh, three of the six principal uh, individuals in the company are graduates of the UMKC uh, School of Computing and Engineering, and they've just recently signed a joint effort with the University of Missouri, Kansas City School of Computing and Engineering uh, to work on what's going to hopefully become a national model of sustainability and energy efficiency, which is called the Green Impact Zone in the Kansas City area. Uh, they're going to collaborate effectively with hopefully other business partners, government agencies, and the university uh, to develop efficient energy solutions, create green jobs, and they themselves are looking at adding about 20 full-time employees sometime in early 2011. Uh, so our assistance with them has helped uh, facilitate what we think will be a successful technology company for years to come. So just a few closing comments is that uh, one area that we're moving into as a program is, uh, is this thought of using the College of Engineering both here at MU and at University of Missouri Rolla uh, is, is making these relationships where the College of Engineering can be the R of the R&D needs uh, of Missouri's businesses. Uh, just one quick success story is that uh, there's a Missouri-based Fortune 500 company that uh, we just began a relationship with. They, they have a product that uses 500,000, they make 500,000 of these uh, very low-tech things a day. Uh, they did a $20,000 research um, research uh, contract with the College of Engineering. 
you had a little burp there. Uh, they had a $20,000 investment for uh, research contract for the College of Engineering. A finite ele element analysis was done, and uh, there's going to be, n on this piece that they make 500000 of a day, they're going to be able to save 9% of the raw material costs with this new design. And that's going to go straight to that company's bottom line. Um, I, don't, I don't know this for certain, but I believe that $20,000 um, investment is going to pay back in a number of, of weeks. So that, that will be huge for them. Um, and it appears that I've lost the ability to advance the slides. So if someone could do that for me. Back one. There we go. So why why did the SBA matter? Um, this this was very important because the the question at the top why is this important to Missouri? The funding for the MoFast effort. This whole thought of federal and state together to advance technology companies was a brainchild of the SBA, and and they brought it to fruition some years ago. Uh, Congress discontinued that funding in 2005, which is indicated by the red arrows. Um, the, well, let me explain. In the chart, this is in the state of Missouri. The blue bars represent the, amount, the dollar amount of submissions that Missouri companies have made, and the green bars represent the dollar amount of awards that have been received, um, both uh, looking back and projected. And uh, anyway, this program, the FAST program was started by the SBA. Congress cut, cut the funding. Um, we've been able, we were able to supplement those dollars with state dollars here in Missouri and reallocate SBA resources that were directed at the Small Business and Technology Development Center to keep the program going. And as you can see by the green arrows, um, that's when uh, the state funding kicked back in to help us. And we are on track to meet those, um, uh, to meet those bars. So we're very proud of that. So why did the SBA matter? Without them starting this and without uh, reallocation of funding from them, th this program would have never happened. So we are now ready for any questions that you may have. Great. Thanks a lot for the, uh, the presentation. So um, folks, are, uh, go ahead and type in any questions you have on the, uh, the chat um, feature there. Um, and uh, Helen, I don't know if you want to um, give folks phone access to. If uh, you guys don't mind, again, this is Jack from the SBA. We had a couple questions that came in earlier, so maybe to get it started, uh, we'll pose a couple of these. In the meantime, we'll keep an eye on the, the chat box here to see if folks type in additional questions. Um, so no, no in, uh, specific individual. I'll let you guys figure out who's got a response to a couple of these. Um, in the tech field, based on the companies that you've worked with, are there any uh, common mistakes or, or misperceptions that a, a tech company coming in for uh, some counseling or support um, uh, often has that you're seeing frequently that you want to share with the members again? Any misperceptions they're, they're um, thinking about whether their tech idea is going to make them successful automatically and they need to round themselves out with business knowledge or perhaps it's something on the finance front? What type of tips would you offer in terms of top mistakes or misperceptions uh, that tech startups have? I think one of the top, top misconceptions would be is that um, a patent is equivalent to a brass ring. And, and what I mean by that is, is that uh, we encounter entrepreneurs every day that have spent a substantial part of their personal wealth, maybe twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars have pursued an idea, uh, received a patent on it or a preliminary patent on it, and believe that now the and believe now that the world is at their uh, you know at their feet, and that that, that certainly isn't the case. A, a patent doesn't equal a lottery ticket. Um, a patent a, a patent is one piece uh, of the overall picture that needs to be uh, um, needs to be assessed and, and acted upon. Yeah, and I would say just to also that, you know, understanding the market you're going after and that uh, technolo technological innovation doesn't necessarily create a business. Uh, so you really need to understand 
what problem you're solving with, with the technology solution you've come up with, and uh, uh, we can help with that. But, but just the innovation itself generally is not enough, even to garner sometimes SBIR funding. Great. Well, we had, we had a funding, a related funding question. Um, somebody posed, upon approval, how long does it take for funding to be received? So I'm not sure um, if there's any clarification points there. It might be for some of the um, SBIR funds or, or, or other uh, funds for early phases. Once you get sort of the initial approval, how long does it take funding materialize by the time it hits your account if you're lucky enough to win one of these investment rounds? Yeah, and in, in terms of the SBIR, from the, from the point of submission date to actually receiving the funds, it can be up to, up to about nine months. Uh, so this can be a time-consuming process. You'll, you'll know your approval probably about at the six-month mark, generally is a safe bet. Each of the agencies have very specific uh, solicitation rounds and timelines, so uh, you can find that information online, but, but that, that's generally the time frame that we tell clients to provide. Okay. And this is Jack again. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, right now for the SBIR funds that are managed at different agencies, of course, SBA sets some policy, but um, there's not one clear online portal if somebody was looking at what NSF or, or other agencies are looking at for these, their use of these funds. You do right now have to sort of go to the individual agency websites to learn about their cycles and what they're learning to invest in. Is that correct? <laughs> well... <laughs> We actually do have a little bit of a cheat sheet. There's a, there's a gentleman uh, who's very active in the SBIR community called Rick Schindel, and uh, he operates a website called zyn.com, that's Z-Y-N.com. And uh, if, you, if you type that in your URL, he focuses on just uh, the SBIR program, or you can just narrow it down to just the SBIR program. And uh, it does allow you to search across different federal agencies. You can search across all the open agencies at any particular time, uh, and, and that's, a, that's a tool we use with our clients pretty, pretty effectively. Cool. Uh, all right. So not government endorsed, but still, uh, what's, not. The, what's for the URL for folks that do want to check it out on their own time? If you just put in, the simplest thing is to just put in zyn.com, Z-Y-N.com, and that should get you to his website. You can also go to uh, grants.gov, which is a government-supported uh, portal and website for SBIR. Now you're going to get, you're going to have to put a lot of filters on to just get SBIR information, which is kind of why we enjoy the Zen site uh, as we do. But there are other resources out there to find uh, grant information. Super, that really helps. Um, hey, any recommendations or insight or opinion about I'm so sort of turkey. I, I fall off the wagon. If I'm not, like, at work or anything, if I'm doing, like, weekends, okay. I, um, I think all the phones are live, so just a reminder for folks. Um, but, again, the question is, uh, any hot tech <laughs> trends or growth areas that you guys as experienced business coaches um, are, are seeing more folks come into, whether it's IT on the security side, green business are there things that, that you think are really hot or, or huge growth areas for the IEEE USA members? Well, I, uh, we're, we're certain uh, here on the MU campus, we're, we're seeing a couple, several hot, uh, seeing yeah. several hot I'm areas. Sure I'm, used to. I'm used to having free, more free range in my mouth. This is sort of some time. Just a mind. reminder for folks, put your individual phones on mute, or Helen, if you want to mute them again, uh, just so the uh, gentleman could provide uh, some answers to these initial questions. Thanks. So again, we we're talking about tech trends to pay attention to. Yeah, we uh, anything in the green space has been hot as of late. Although my my feel is is that is that uh, green green to be green doesn't uh, doesn't have much validity. It needs to be green with a purpose. And 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 again, just like with anything else, a business case has to be built. Um, here on the MU campus, something that's been incredibly hot with students has been uh, developing uh, iPhone and Android apps. Um, there have been uh, there have been students making a good bit of money by doing uh, by coming in and and doing a 99 or creating an app for 99 cents, uh, posting it on uh, Apple's or Droid's website, having that be downloaded, and the man the money magically appears in their checkbook. Um, 
it, it's been almost astonishing, but uh, that's been very hot here on the MU campus uh, as of late, primarily with our uh, uh, School of Journalism being involved in new media. But uh, but yeah, green and, and then the, the tech applications, certainly. I would encourage any engineering uh, people thinking about, you know, developing a product or it, the SBIR program is well suited for that. You know, if you're creating a device or something tangible, uh, the SBIR, SBIR does fund, you know, therapeutics and drug development and some of these other long-term tech solutions. But uh, the way the phase system is set up, as Jim has uh, illustrated earlier with phase one and then phase two, um, it almost lends itself organically to some sort of, sort of device-related uh, technology. So, um, you know, that's something that generally favors sort of an engineering mindset. So that's something that might be, uh, might be something to consider. Great, great. We had another question that, that uh, came in online that reminds me of a question that was posed to the SBA at a, a conference last week. Um, when folks are talking about SBIR or other investment, then, then the conversation gets into sort of the university settings. And quite often the success stories there, there sound like it's, hey, a group of professors did this or some students did that. But if I'm not associated with the university and I'm a tech startup, how do I avail myself of those tech or of the university resources and, and or, again, if I'm not uh, associated with the university, do I have a, a snowball's chance in hell of getting an SBIR uh, grant? Again, if I'm a basement entrepreneur not associated with the university, how do I avail myself of the university resources, or can I get any of these grants uh, not being associated with a large institution? Well, the, the, reason that, the reason that Missouri has placed itself strategically in the way that it has is that, is that what, what university researchers greatly lack is the uh, capacity to commercialize. Um, you know, the world's expert on nanotechnology may be across the street here from me, but not have, uh, you know, one minute's understanding about how that can become a commercializable product. So uh, that research and uh, the commercial entities that reside in our state um, have to do this almost in concert with each other. So back to the question is, um, uh, you know, what's available for the basement entrepreneur? Well, almost on a daily basis, uh, in, in fact, we kind of joke here a little bit about it being Match.com, but, but uh, on a daily basis, we try to make those connections between um, the research that's on the shelf and somebody that needs, uh, needs answers. Um, so that's something uh, our office has been uh, recognized university-wide as the, the front door of the university in that regard uh, to try and make those connections. So uh, that's one thing that we do. Um, and so my, what I do here when someone comes into my office, what I try to do is to match them here with somebody on our campus first, uh, within the system second, within the state third, and then I'll, uh, you know, if I still can't find resolution, I'll, I'll I'll start looking outside the state to my counterparts in other states to see if we can make a match. So um, we, we do ro work really hard at trying to make that happen. Now, one thing that we will coach you if you were a small business coming in would be is that with the university as a partner, it does increase your chances of winning an SBIR, STTR. And, and the reason behind that is is that if you're looking at it from the funder's perspective, where can they put money that will be lesser risk? Would that money be lesser risk to a guy just in a basement by himself, or would that be lesser risk to somebody in a basement who has the power of a research <coughs> university with them? Uh, when Missouri created their program, we recognized that one of the deficiencies, universities don't know how to move it out, how to move commercial, how to move research into commercialization. Jim alluded to that. And companies don't know how to access universities. So we configured ourselves in a way to solve that problem. And that's the reason we have the two leaders that we have with us today. Uh, Jim, his primary task is to understand the university and how to access it and what's here and how to use it. 
Francis's primary responsibility is to understand what's out in the state and to use our people to access those companies and understand those companies well enough to understand what they're looking for. And then the two of them can get together and we can link that company through to the right person. Uh, that was really how we've reconfigured this program is to solve that very problem. Nobody else in Missouri is doing that. Nobody else is probably capable of doing that. Uh, because nobody else has access to a statewide delivery system and access to the university simultaneously. So, you know, it becomes clear that we're the logical entity to serve that purpose. Because even the technology providers can't do that in our state. So, uh, we've been working very methodically to create this kind of a system by using our existing SBTDC network out there. You heard Jim say at the beginning we had uh, several people assigned to this program. That's why. So we can reach the companies. Great. And um, a sort of a related question. Somebody um, was asking um, in their area if they wanted to reach out to an SBDC to get some of the uh, services you guys are, m are mentioning. What would you recommend? Uh, you know, look them up on SBA's uh, website, use their favorite search engine, find the SBDC network in their particular area, and uh, give a call, schedule a visit, or, or check out information online. What would you guys, as, as folks within the SBDC network, recommend to potential uh, clients? I, I would say all those things. <laughs> the, uh, uh, it, an entrepreneur can be can build an awareness of the support structures that are around them, and and very often in their particular locale, an, an SBDC or SBTDC will be uh, will be one of those uh, people in support of what it is they're trying to do. Um, yeah, the the SBA website, uh, the Association of Small Business Development Centers website um, would have index listings. Uh, but yeah, a search, you know, a search engine search would 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 get you um, your your local resources as well. Um, I might also mention that well, here on the next slide is yeah. we also have uh, a website that is MissouriBusiness.net. Of course, that's available for anyone. But uh, I haven't counted them, but there's probably 10,000 pages of information on there about. Uh, business, business startups, just a huge amount of resources there. And I'm, I'm told by our web folks that this is one of the uh, most, uh, has one of the highest hit rates uh, for small business information in the country. So um, certainly that's available to you as well. And we were, just for your information, uh, Rhonda Abrams, who's a Washington, D.C. author, identified the seven best websites to go to for business assistance. We were one of the seven. We're very proud of that. Cool, cool. Hey, um, one last question before we wrap it up, um, uh, but appreciate the, uh, the, the suggestions on how to contact folks, local uh, small business development centers. I think in the chat we had plugged a couple Twitter accounts, including the Missouri Business uh, Twitter account, too, if folks want to follow. Um, some of the discussion uh, on Twitter. Uh, but the last question, can you guys provide um, your suggestions or what you've seen when some of the smaller technology firms are building relationships with larger businesses? Um, if a small tech uh, outfit does build one of these relationships, uh, frequently does large business sort of uh, try to dominate or, or move the smaller company aside and say that they'll drive all the technology forward, maybe they're just going to try to benefit from the, uh, the great idea the small entrepreneur brought into the door, and then the tech, uh, the larger firm is going to try to dominate again. And, and if that is the case, how do I protect myself from that small tech firm? Is it through a business agreement or other resource? I would say uh, it's something you want to address relatively early. Uh, there are large businesses that focus uh, and monitor the, for instance, the SBIR program, particularly uh, the phase two solicitations. Even though these large businesses can't participate, uh, they are looking to talk with small businesses that are participating in the SBIR program at the phase two level. Um, what they will end up doing is generally offering to subcontract on that grant to the small business, uh, which can be, as you've already kind of talked about and in the question, 
can be a double-edged sword because you don't maybe necessarily want to lose your independence uh, and moving the technology forward. Um, generally, the place to do that is maybe after you've won a phase one or you have some technology that you think you might need to partner with a, with a large business. Uh, I would have those conversations early, have a clear uh, determination on where you want to go. Uh, in some cases, some, some entrepreneurs are very happy to exit to a large company and do it again. These are our serial entrepreneurs, so uh, if it makes financial sense, you know, they'd be more than willing to, to sell the technology or, or, or work with a larger uh, corporation and move that forward. Um, it's almost on a case-by-case -case basis, but, the, but to work with a business professional, one of our counselors, or somebody trusted uh, in an advisory role so that you know where you're going as early as possible, that's the best way to, to sort of head off any untoward situation in the future. Great. Well, we appreciate uh, that, and um, if uh, since all the phone lines are mute, uh, if you'll take uh, Phil and my uh, clapping as a, uh, a round of applause for all the uh, participants. <laughs> Thanks, guys. That was a great uh, webinar. Thanks, everybody that dialed in and for the uh, online chat. Hope that we covered uh, just about all the questions. As uh, Helen from the IEEE USA uh, mentioned, the slides will be presented uh, afterwards. Again, uh, check out some of the websites, the Twitter accounts, or reach out to your local uh, SBDC uh, if you have any questions or want any other hands-on advice or check with your local SBA office. And, of course, if you're in Missouri, you know that you've got a Cracker Jack team there that are going to walk you through all these uh, resources and hopefully um, help you uh, either start your business if you're just thinking about it or wildly grow your business if you've already taken the first step in entrepreneurship. So, gentlemen, uh, thanks again, Jim, Max, and Francis, for um, all you do within the SBA network and for leading this webinar. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Take care, everybody. We'll see you on the next webinar probably about two or three weeks from now. Uh, IEEE USA will send out a notification. Thanks. All right. Bye-bye.